Pekné popoludne, vážené dámy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome at the conference Neurodiversity at Workplace. This conference is organized by Profesia Porto through its non-profit program Help with Heart. This conference is focused on how we can engage more people with disabilities in the labor market because we have people who want to work, they could work, they're able to work, but so far in Slovakia we have not used this human potential. I could actually say that we're wasting this potential and this conference will try to change it. So anybody who is interested in this issue can take part in this conference. If you'd like to ask questions to our speakers, you can also participate, you who are present in this style event hall or those of you who are online in front of your screens through Slido application, you can ask questions to our speakers. Just put the code NEUROdiversity2022, you see the link on your screens. Of course, we should thank to the partners of this conference, including Fulbright Slovakia, Charter, Carta Di Diversity Charter Slovakia, Stila Event Hall and Social Enterprise Kakao. Thanks to this company, we have great non-alcoholic beverages. We also want to thank the people who, are, who do not g get gratitude, but they are very important. Interpreters from English language, Marek Travinček and Zuzana Vinanska, and also to the interpreters uh, from barrier free communication from sign language, David Marco and Paolo Roman. And we also need to thank to our volunteers who have participated in the preparation of this event, to Marek Sr uh, Srniak, Tomasz Hosmaj and the students at the uh, secondary vocational school at Dubravska uh, Street in Bratislava. Now let's talk about our agenda. We have five sections, five lectures. First will be in Slovak, the remaining four presentations will be in English. After each section you'll get the space to ask questions from audience, as I said, via Slido application. So follow these presentations attentively and should you have any questions you can ask them in the application. You can include your name or ask anonymously. There are no stupid questions. We all follow the same goal to help people with disabilities to find jobs at labor markets. After two presentations we'll have a short coffee break and after that we will have remaining three presentations and the conclusion of the conference. I will introduce myself. My name is Shimon Zdarsky and it's a great, great honor for me to guide you during this conference. I'd like to welcome and invite to the podium Mrs. Ivata Molnarova, who is the country director of Profesia. Ivana, please, you have the floor. I hope it's work, the microphone is working. Yes, good afternoon. I will start in a non-traditional way. I'm a big fan of Formula One. And on Saturday, there was the last, on Sunday, there was the last uh, race. And I'm fascinated uh, due to a number of reasons, not because of the speed, but also due to the organization of the whole team. And one thing came to my mind, why are some teams more successful than other teams? A lot of money is invested and we only see the drivers, maybe we see some teams and the formula, cars, the vehicles and I read an interesting book, it's called Mechanist and I read an interview and I realized why some teams are more successful than others and it's about culture and their values. Imagine the formula would come to the pit stop and in two seconds, which is the, the, the fastest pit stop, they can exchange four tires and they put new tires. So they exchange them in a couple of seconds and the people are nervous. There's a lot of pressure and obviously mistakes happen and people make these mistakes, obviously. 
And now imagine after a bad pit stop when something goes wrong and the car is not functional, the vehicle is not functional and suddenly imagine that the team starts to blame the person who made the mistake and maybe they would uh, fire him. What would happen in the team? Well, a fear would start, people would be afraid of making mistakes and the pressure would uh, spread, which would spread within the team, would actually disturb the success in the team. And now I'll come back to Profesia, profession, Profesia. Our company has celebrated 25 years of existence. In course of 25 years, we've uh, built a dominant position at uh, labor market. We are commercially successful, but we never cared only about clients who pay. But it was always, it has always been uh, equally important to take care of job seekers, and especially job seekers who are on the margins, on the margins of labor market. And I remember. A few years ago, Dali Bor is here with us and Martin Menschik is here with us. We had a beautiful uh, strategic uh, meeting. It was in Leberfinger restaurant. Uh, we knew that we would get a, an award via bonus for Edu Jobs and we did a lot of CSR activities, even more than we were capable and there was a big chaos in this. And at this strategic meeting, an important decision was made. Let's narrow down our activities and let's set out a CSR strategy. Uh, and we would work on one or two topics which are very important for us. As for our company, where can we be useful and how can we help? Because this dominance and commercial success, it doesn't just mean that we'll bring profits to our owners. It also means responsibility to be responsible for forming uh, the labor market. So we made a decision that we would form this labor market. We would help the education system. And the second decision was that we would help much more, more deeply with people with various uh, disabilities. It was also important that we opened a new position, CSR manager and Anka Podlesna came to our company, Anna. She organized the mess. <laughs> And uh, she brought some system to our ideas in, and she started it to implement it in practice and complete things. Help with Heart Academy for School Principals was established. And I remember when we talked to Anna, when she was preparing, when she came, uh, what, asking me, what do I think that if she goes to the United States? And I was amazed. Well, I, I knew this was not going to be an e easy decision. She had a little son and she would have to go out of her comfort zone and go abroad for one year. But I fully supported her that she should try it and bring this know-how to Slovakia. And I see Anna Anka as a great driver, Formula One driver and the vehicle. This is the know-how which she brought, and you will hear about it today. But what is even more important is that she is not going to do it by herself. Like in Formula One, it cannot be done just by the driver, but the people behind that. These people include pe uh, professional staff or parents who have children with disabilities or companies which will open their doors to these people and they will show that it's possible or organizations we work with the state the government which can be very helpful coaches leaders and anybody else who will overcome the, the barriers who will overcome the prejudice which we're facing and we can create unique values in this project values like trust of overcoming these barriers and especially the courage to make mistakes because these paths have been tried and it's important to have the courage so that we try the, the new ways 
because I see that this has future and we can only do this together. So have a nice day and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Mrs. Molnarova. I just want to remind you that Profesia company got an award via Bona in 2019 concerning the, the contribution in employment of people with the, the health disabilities. So these are not just words, but it's a corporate culture. Now I'd like to welcome the partners of this conference, Lydia Tobiasova, Fulbright Slovakia Executive Director, Lydia Tobiasova, and Ivana Vagaska, who is the Executive di Director of Business Leaders Forum, who is an Administrator of Diversity Charter of Slovakia. I'd like to ask you directly, why is this issue important for you as partners of this conference? Could you explain it to us? I'll just move. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have prepared something which I would like to say, but Madame Otnarova mentioned some of the points, so I will improvise a bit. But first of all, it's a great delight and it's a great honor for me to participate at this conference. Thank you very much to Anka Podlesna and to Profesia. I'd like to say that I am an executive director of Fulbright uh, Commission. If you have never heard about Fulbright program, I believe it's necessary to give you some facts because they are related to this conference. Fulbright program is one of the biggest and most prestigious international exchange programs in the world, which was established in 1946 after the Second World War in the United States. And it is functioning on the basis of bilateral agreements between the United States and partnership countries. Fulbright Committee is this the organization which is administering this program in Slovakia. We are a bilateral autonomous organization which is funded together by the US government and the Slovak government. And we are offering various grants, grants for students, teachers, university teachers, experts uh, from practice, uh, scientists, artists, in order to fulfill our mission, which is to support mutual understanding between the United States and Slovakia. So this is a wider framework of our mission. And at this moment, maybe you ask yourself a question, what am I doing here and why are we connected? Why is Fulbright connected with this topic, neuro neurodiversity at workplace and diversity and work at all? Well, it's one of our graduates. Anka Podlesna, she's one of the graduates of our programs. As Mrs. Molnarova said, she had a 10-month state admission against State University within Humphrey Fellowship. It's a grant for young experts who get a chance to travel, to, to go to partnership institutions, to spend 10 months there within postgraduate studies. It's a combination of an academic program with a six weeks uh, internship. And the aim of this program is to support leadership between foreign experts who meet and share experience, knowledge, and uh, they enhance the expertise in the fields of critical uh, areas like human rights, sustainable development, uh, development of communities and others. So Anka got this grant and she was working on this in the United States. I'm very pleased that she learned a lot and she got inspiration. This is the aim of these grants that Slovaks can travel to the US, that they learn something, they get some inspiration and come back and bring this know-how back to Slovakia. It is said that Fulbright changes lives. Yes, it changes lives afterwards because in this environment where our alumni uh, work, they can influence the lives in communities, they improve uh, our society. So this is one common point. And I also want to say that Anka got another grant after this scholarship uh, alumni impact work, which uh, supports the topics which uh, she dealt with in the United States. And the second common point between Slovakia and uh, between 
uh, us our common values. Fulbright program also recognizes the value of diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion was a unifying or a central idea of the 75th anniversary of Fulbright uh, program in the world in 2021. It was a central motive of the celebrations of our alumni and our program. Fulbright committee and Fulbright program is trying to, in its programs and activities, when selecting candidates, when supporting the travel uh, pro the programs, exchange programs, and when supporting the uh, alumni, we try to take into account this diversity and inclusion. The possibilities are open to anybody, and is, uh, especially we want to call upon those who are from marginalized and not sufficient to represented communities to be engaged in our programs. So diversity and inclusion are the main common points, and I'm very pleased that this is a central topic of this conference and that our alumni is a living example of how, what should be the impact of such a stay, what our alumni should bring, and I'm glad that we can see palpable results, tangible, tangible results of their work. It's not just their work, but, and we see that our work uh, has a meaning, and we thank uh, Professor that uh, she got the support because it's not easy to let one of your staff to go to 10 months. So I thank to the profession, Professia Company, and uh, I wish you a successful conference and a successful implementation of the program in practice. Good afternoon. I represent the Diversity Charter Slovakia. So the name shows what is common for us, which is support of uh, diversity and inclusion. Our charter links the employers who decide voluntarily to declare the principles of supporting diversity and inclusion. At the end of today's agenda, we will accept new signatories. So I hope that you will stay till the end. And we have nine new companies, not only companies, also embassies or research and institutions and academia. They will join the charter. But this is not just about the signature. What we do is that we organize various events about various topics. There is a lot of them under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion, and we try to give them specific advice how to transfer this, how to implement uh, this in their everyday lives. What we often miss is a practical conclusion. We know what should be done in some topics, but we're not able to recommend to our companies or signatories a specific mediator or some guide, someone who would guide them on the way when it comes to some specific issues. When it comes to employment of uh, people with disabilities, this has been resolved actually thanks to unique activities of Profesia and thanks to a huge know-how and enthusiasm of Anka Podlesna and we're very pleased and we recommend the help with heart and we will continue to help Profesia Anka that this is the way that employers can embark on. She's the person people can turn to or contact so that they can start to employ people from with the disabilities. So I want to thank Professia for Anka, that we have a person we can recommend, and I'm looking forward to today's conference and everything we will hear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies. And now I would like to invite to the stage uh, the lady that has been mentioned so many times, uh, and without her, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be here. So, Anka Podlesna, please join me. Well, I don't really feel very encouraged by the introduction. So, Anka, you work with uh, marginalized uh, people uh, at uh, Profesia, and you will talk to us about how 
the businesses uh, can adapt to their workplaces or uh, to uh, welcome people with disabilities. Yes, so uh, we're going to show you some data and also some experience uh, that we have, and we will try to open the door uh, to our cooperation, you know, through Professia Lab, how we can make a step forward. And hopefully, I'm not going to be uh, so so afraid, you know, as I am now. Now, what be some? To start with, I would like to say that uh, many times we look at the data at Profesia, but uh, when it comes to employing people with disabilities, uh, we do not have that many data. There is a mismatch. Uh, between the data and uh, definitions that are used uh, globally and in Slovakia. And also, we do not have uh, statistical data uh, in terms of this group. Uh, for example, as of today, there are 1,600 uh, CVs uh, at uh, Profesia uh, that are available. Uh, and in the statistical data of job offices, it's only hundreds of uh, CVs. So which group is uh, uh, easiest to employ and how many uh, people uh, are, you know, job seekers with disabilities? Well, that's very difficult to know. Uh, at Profesia, we use the term uh, people with handicaps, not just people with a, a disability. Uh, it's wider than just uh, people with disability. There are quite a lot of people in the gray zone, so people who do not uh, maybe achieve uh, this uh, uh, level of uh, being able to uh, have uh, work. Uh, so these, uh, that is 40%, uh, so they are not defined by law as uh, uh, you know disabled people. And that's why when you read our materials, we use the term which in Slovak means uh, people with handicaps, uh, but it's basically uh, people with disabilities. Uh, but according to the WHO, more than one trillion people in the world uh, uh, lives uh, with uh, a uh, uh, lives with a disability in the world. And I would like to ask you, how many of you uh, know someone among your friends or colleagues? Uh, uh, how many of you know someone with a disability? If you can raise your hand. I'm, s I'm sorry not to have a mirror here, but unfortunately, this is a reality. Uh, almost uh, all of us uh, will experience uh, some kind of uh, a health handicap in our lifetime, so temporary or permanent, uh, or at some stages, some stage of our lives. Uh, uh, it may be something we are born with or something that we acquire during our lifetime. But what's very important is uh, that uh, this, the work and employment means a meaningful way of uh, spending time. And when we want to talk about these topics, it's because we want to give a chance to everyone who wants to work. I've got some figures from the US where uh, the employment rates among people with disabilities is uh, followed uh, in the whole uh, sample of uh, people with disabilities. So when it comes to hearing impairment, uh, they are the easiest uh, to uh, employ, you know, people who are uh, who have a hearing uh, impairment, uh, so they are easiest to follow. Uh, Caleb from Peckham will be here, and uh, I he will tell you more about it. But there are people with hearing impairment, uh, and uh, they work for their company. In terms of people with visual impairment, uh, there are about forty percent of them, and the. Uh, people with reduced mobility and mental disorders uh, and neurodevelopmental disorders or sorry differences uh, uh, that's about 25 percent you know that's uh, the rate of uh, employment um, this is a unique uh, survey that Profesia carries out I think as the only one in uh, uh, Slovakia we do it also in the Czech Republic in Poland uh, 
in Western Europe and also in Finland. So this is uh, how uh, people are visible on the open labor market. The least visible are LGBTI uh, people and people with a certain handicap. Uh, we have uh, finished this uh, uh, survey. Uh, we've got the data for 2022 and we will communicate it. Now, but what is important to say is uh, that when we look uh, at job seekers, we need to look at him or her in a comprehensive manner. It's not only about a health handicap, but also uh, about a social uh, handicap, uh, maybe a different uh, color of the skin. Or uh, there was a lady uh, whose uh, husband uh, died during COVID uh, and uh, she wanted to work, uh, but uh, she uh, couldn't find job because her son uh, started to have a mental problem. He started to uh, self-harm himself. And uh, so she was in a very difficult situation. Why are we doing what we are doing? This uh, survey that I showed to you and uh, which we're going to talk about also after the conference. So who's got a personal experience uh, has um, uh, twice or is uh, twice as likely to have a positive uh, attitude. And uh, we want uh, these job seekers uh, to get a real work experience. Uh, and also we don't want uh, Uh, or we want to help uh, NGOs and we want to help also career uh, counselors because they're in a difficult situation. We often uh, talk to uh, employers, you know, what they are afraid of, uh, what are the barriers. And there are different uh, answers from those uh, companies uh, that have a personal experience with having employed someone with a disability. Uh, so those uh, who have this experience, uh, usually the answers uh, are related uh, to uh, work performance, uh, uh, safety at uh, uh, work, uh, and uh, the accessibility of work uh, is usually in the last place. But for those who don't have this experience, uh, the accessibility of the workplace is usually in the first place of the survey. Uh, you can also uh, get hold of the materials uh, on uh, the accessibility of the workplace, uh, the ways uh, how these uh, places can be adapted. Uh, there are different assistive uh, technologies uh, and ways how to include people. And that's how we, what we want to do through Professia Lab to help employers to get their own experience with the help of community partners. But we know that the open labor market is interested in the work performance and, you know, businesses need a profit. And obviously we can do this because we are profitable. But what you can see in the first place is uh, work experience. When I came here for the first time, we have our uh, volunteers here, uh, you know, uh, students uh, from a vocational school here in Bratislava. They were scared, you know, telling me we have never worked before. And we want to give a chance to people to give them a chance to experience uh, different situations. And, you know, work placement uh, is uh, just uh, something quite easy for uh, companies to do, you know, much easier than uh, uh, giving a contract to someone. Uh, but uh, what uh, employers are interested in are very often soft skills, you know, English language. Uh, when we talk to schools, we also say that it's very important to pay attention to English because it's uh, the main communication tool and very often our materials in English uh, so that we don't have to translate them. But then you can also see communication skills uh, uh, responsibility, autonomy. Uh, Connie Sang, uh, a professor from the Michigan Michigan State University, will follow after my presentation. And 90% uh, of people with disabilities are not able to retain a job, not to acquire a job, but to retain it because they don't have sufficient communication skills. And uh, the job uh, preparedness of people with disabilities, you know, that is something we want to work on uh, with the asset program that uh, Ms. Sung is going to talk about. Uh, 
Uh, since 1997, uh, since uh, Professia Portal was created, uh, we have uh, uh, been working on these uh, different uh, topics, also thanks uh, to our uh, founder, Dalibor. Uh, we uh, have a regular audit uh, from the Union of uh, uh, Blind uh, uh, People and uh, it's not always easy, but it's a basic thing that each company should do. We also wanted to support uh, protected workshops uh, and uh, social enterprises. So that is uh, uh, employing people through these uh, uh, protected workplaces. So since uh, 2013, you are able to find these uh, protected workplaces on our portal. And also we have introduced uh, an option to uh, give uh, handicap or disability in the CV and what's really important, you know, those uh, little uh, maybe uh, nudges, uh, you know, we want to help employers not to be afraid and not to be afraid to invite uh, people uh, to uh, with disabilities to interviews uh, in our database that has existed since 2018 uh, we have about 1600 uh, cvs of uh, people with uh, disabilities and they are available to companies free of charge and uh, it has been mentioned that I spent uh, uh, some time in the US uh, and that uh, was uh, mainly uh, focused uh, on how to help uh, people with disabilities and how to help employers and how to address this gap, uh, how to you know make a really, really big step after uh, COVID uh, and after what's happening because of the war in Ukraine on the labor market, you know, so uh, to move forward through Professia Lab. So the approach is changing in a radical way. We don't want to fix the, uh, the, the individual. We do not want to uh, correct his or her deficiencies, but we want to change our mindset and to adapt the environment to tap into the potential of all individuals. So uh, there are many options how we can adapt and change what's not working. And that's the main point, you know, um, maybe why this approach is uh, much braver than in the past. But at the same time, we are aware uh, of certain facts and there are many people who have experience with it that very often these differences are interrelated. Uh, whether it's a national minority, different color of the skin, or also, you know, when we see a certain relation uh, between the statistics uh, of the evolution of people uh, in the LGBT community and autism, etc. So we would like those who sign the diversity charter to agree with the principles of diversity. So the speakers who will come after will talk about these important topics and I believe that in a year's time we're going to have Slovak speakers not just US speakers you know who will talk about their experience uh, it uh, we uh, bring space uh, for cooperation uh, we bring a training called asset uh, uh, which is uh, focused on soft skills uh, and employment uh, and it is a uh, aimed at people uh, who want to help people with uh, disabilities, uh, job seekers with disabilities who want to find uh, an internship in uh, summer months uh, can uh, sign up for it. Uh, and this is organized uh, in cooperation with Michigan State University. Uh, there are, of course, uh, entities who have been working with people with disabilities for a long time. But what do we want to do? We want to share the knowledge and to uh, share uh, our work on the same uh, platform. We don't want anyone to give up their know-how that they have, but uh, we want to uh, 
uh, unify the standards, so we want to offer to the companies one unified model. For example, if Tesco's want to find someone in Bratislava or in Prashov, uh, we want them to follow the same procedures when integrating uh, people with disabilities in the workplace, and we also want companies to use their own pilot programs and to offer internships to one, two or three people. All this information, uh, you can download it uh, from uh, the Professia Lab guide, but I have to give you one uh, important piece of information. Um, obviously, you know, uh, when we were preparing uh, the conference, obviously, you know, not always everything's working or going according to a plan, but there's something that's not working at the moment. I mean, uh, the registration uh, due to a technical error. And uh, so please, if it's not working today, uh, just uh, try again tomorrow uh, yeah at, at the moment uh, the registration for a company is not working but it's not it's not our you know fault it's something beyond our control so who can sign up for the asset program so job seekers who want to work on the open labor market that's very important very important piece of information they should have time uh, at least uh, two hours per week uh, to uh, do the asset uh, training. Uh, there will be uh, graduates, or sorry, there will be students of the uh, vocational uh, school uh, from uh, Dubrovska Cesta in Bratislava who will take part in it, but there will be also four groups that will be open to the public uh, who can sign up for this uh, coaching, these are organizations who want to spend uh, long term uh, on this uh, project uh, and uh, who can assign one worker, uh, for example, for uh, around 64 hours uh, from January to June 2023, and they are able to accompany uh, job seekers uh, during uh, summer internships in the region. All this information is detailed in the, this material that you can download from the website, but we've got them published uh, here as well. And there will be work documentation that will be ready uh, for you in January. And I can tell you, yes, you can do it. Um, Mayo Bednar, that's a success, very nice success story. And also cooperation with uh, Tesco. So if I remember correctly, 20 persons have been integrated. To, it's an inspiring story uh, that shows us that it's possible. And how we can see the skills of people in a comprehensive manner uh, at Tesco's diversity in the workplace uh, is uh, uh, described uh, very nicely. So now I would like to pass uh, to the next speaker, Connie Sang, associate professor from Michigan. I hope she is online. She created the asset program and uh, you know, originally it was uh, prepared uh, for people with uh, for mental disorders or the autistic uh, spectrum disorders, but later uh, they found out uh, that this program is suitable for, you know, a wide uh, range of people with disabilities. And so we are bringing this program to Slovakia and we would like to see to what extent uh, the successful transition uh, or the success of the transition uh, from school to work can increase if people have these uh, soft communication skills. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask the technicians uh, to show us Kony. Yes, I can see Kony. Okay. Can we hear each other? Yes. Hi, okay. Anna. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you. So we have a crowd of people listening here to your presentation. And I was just completing information about Asset, that you was one of the researchers who developed the program. And we would like to hear how it can actually make impact in Slovakia and how was it developed and what probably we should expect. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and share about the work. I have to give a lot of credits to Anna. She worked really hard with her team in Slovakia and trying to bring asset program to Slovakia. Before I start, um, so today's presentation is about from school to labor market assistive 
soft skills and employment training. So how we came up with the acronym ASSET is we really want to help individuals with disabilities to become asset to their employers, to their company. So this program has been um, validated and and tested in different countries, including in Ireland, in Hong Kong, and across different states in the United States. So I'm currently the co-director of the MSU Strife Center, which stands for Services, Training, and Research for Independence and Desired Employment. And I'm also the director of the MSU Step Lab, which stands for Supporting Transition and Employment Preparation Lab. So to begin the presentation, before I go into talk about asset, I would like to give an overview of the reason why we develop asset. So the first is we have seen a lot of individuals on the autism spectrum disorder in the United States that have been diagnosed with the, um, the condition, which we know is a lifespan condition, which affect the many aspects, including the independent living, the employment, the education, and the quality of life. While there are special education services, many do not qualify for adult service. If you look at the graph here on the right-hand side, according to research, we know 36% of the individuals with autism, they attend post-secondary education, which on the other hand, we know 64% actually is not attending any of their post-secondary education. And only 19% of them were able to live independently. And 58%, they're able to get a job, either part-time or full-time. And 42% um, of them actually do not have a paid job. And if you look at here, even these results is concerning. Only 74% of people of the people on this autism spectrum access to services. So on the other hand is approximately 26% have no services at all. So many parents describe it as falling off the cliff is when they leave the school, they don't really know where to go, what to do. And then it end up transition from the school to their basement on their couch. So when we look at the existing intervention, what are some of the intervention that is helpful? So that include work-related intervention, um, mental health intervention, and some other intervention. But if we look at specifically soft skills related intervention, we did a systematic um, analysis. Many of the intervention only focus on children when they are younger age, but very few of them focus on young adults or older adults. And many of them are actually implemented in clinic or school-based settings, but not so much in the community-based settings. And not many of them really use rigorous research design to validate the impact of the intervention program. And of course, like I mentioned here, out of the systematic review, they're, they're not single systematic study, really focus on the development and the validation of the work-related social skills. So as you see in the chart here, it really speaks about the need for developing interventions that specifically target work-related social skills, employment readiness, and mental health needs of um, individuals with ASD. So why we specifically select the development of the soft skills or social skills are so important. So according to the U.S. Department of Labor, we know majority of the people who lose their jobs are due to soft skills. So 90% of the people who lose their job were because of the soft skills, according to the employer. And only 10% of them are due to hard skills. So soft skills, as we define it, um, it is defined as unquantifiable attributes that cannot be proven, but must be demonstrated through work style and approach. So that include communication, leadership, teamwork, creativity. So given the information that we have seen, we really have the need to address the soft skills and job readiness for youth and young adults with ASD. And the program should not only target on their soft skills, but also the mental health, how those 
soft skills or work-related social skills will improve the interaction in the workplace, eventually improve their mental health. And a program that will develop their self-awareness and promote their self-confidence and motivation. So we have been looking into the different existing activities, instructional design that includes in that have inclusive practices. So they, that lead to the development of the curriculum. As we know, a theory-driven and empirical-based intervention program is really important to help us understand what would be the impact of the intervention program. So as that is developed based on the social cognitive career theory that has a specific focus on developing the self-confidence, the outcome expectation, and also the individual and external support for the individual in order to lead to a development of the goal, the interest, and eventually the career development. So in the development process of asset, we involve multidisciplinary experts in the design development and the delivery, including experts in rehab counseling, special education, occupational therapy, human resources, and educational technology. And we also use a community-based approach, which means we include participants with autism, the facilitators who use asset, their families, employers, and other service provider to give us feedback what worked, what didn't work, and how we should improve asset. We used a group process for the peer learning and implemented the didactic discussion practice sequence. So in each of the session, they would, they would um, apply the sequence to help them learn the different skills and knowledge. And we made the asset to be manualized, which I believe Anna has the menu to, um, for you guys to review and have a better understanding of what asset really is. So the menu really helped with the user to better understand what each of the sessions should be implemented so that it can be used in both educational and vocational rehab settings. So in the asset curriculum, we focus on the different areas that have been identified by the employers, by the service providers that are considered as important soft skills. So these are the 12 different modules that we focus on in the curriculum, including communication, positive attitude and enthusiasm, teamwork, networking and digital identity, problem solving and critical thinking, professionalism, disability awareness and self-efficacy, time management and planning, mental health and stress management, emotion recognition and regulation, awareness of self and others, and finally, workplace, workplace relationships. So all of these modules are identified as important essential skills to be equipped in each of the employees, regardless of their disability or not. So here is a sample program structure. So in each of the group, we have approximately six to eight participants led by one to two facilitators. And my understanding is in Slovakia, we will have two sessions in each day per week, and each of the session will be about 45 minutes. In US, we, because of the um, scheduling here, we have a version of 50 minute and 90 minute, depending on the settings that are implemented. But each session, they will have to go through all the different activities, including discussion, uh, role play, and self-reflection, all the things that listed here in a simulated work environment. So we focus a lot on the pedagogy that we use in the asset curriculum. So these are the 10, we call it Big 10 because MSU is one of the Big 10 schools in United States. So first of all is the didactics, providing information in a lecture format. We also implemented modeling, discussion, video feedback, experiential activities that they can do it hands-on practice, role play, self-reflection, practice, performance, feedback, and reinforcement. So along with the curriculum that we have the manuals and handout, for each session, we also have a very comprehensive set of PowerPoints for, in, for the facilitators to use in order to deliver the content. We also created different kind of videos and um, to go along with the PowerPoint. And we also have the facilitator training, sorry, and the parent training. Um, for them to better understand and provide the, the information that they can use to help with the um, learning of the participants. 
We have the program kit as well as the work platform for them to access the information on the web. Um, so just wanted to share some pilot study results. Uh, we have conducted a three-year pilot study with the asset program. So based on the participants' feedback, we have seen changes in work-related knowledge and social skills over 80% of the participants. They demonstrated changes in teamwork, communication, network, networking, and socialization, attitude, and enthusiasm. And second, we also have seen over 70% of the participants share that they have increased confidence in using the soft skills that learned in asset. So these are the two quotes that I would like to share that is directly provided by the participants. First one, the participants said, communication was a pretty big change for me. Yesterday at work, several customers came up to me to ask questions. I did not shy away. I talked to them. In the past, I would have been frozen. The second is, quote that we got from the participant is, understanding and realizing how to learn from mistakes can improve my self-confidence in using my soft skills. So these are the direct quotes from the participants that really speak to the impact of the program. And some of the participants also mentioned about the steps that they would take after um, participating in the asset program is to continue work on their resume and search for internships or job opportunities, to practice interviews, implement impression management tactics, and network with peers and professionals. They also talked about they will do better in planning and making decisions about their next steps in their career development. Oh. So overall, the impact of the program we have seen include in increasing their self-awareness, the self-confidence, the sense of belonging, sharing a sense of personal relatedness, and ability to accept the differences and their new perspective. So here's the quote that we got from the participant is, before, I did not think I could get a job, but now I think I can. And over 80% of the participants rated high satisfaction with the asset program, rating between eight to 10 um, out of the 10 scale. So here are the quotes that we, we um, got from the participants. Improved social skills allow me to enjoy talking with people more and feel less nervous while doing so. And it helped me a lot with my soft skills, which I didn't really know about before. And I need to improve. So here are some other quotes that we got from the participants, including goal settings related is asset made me think about what kind of job I want to have and whether or not it pays. Related soft, to soft skills is help me with my soft skills that often is hard. We often forget, just try to catch up and develop hard skills what employers essentially want. And related to teamwork, we have participants said, nice to be able to see how different personalities can work together. And in terms of mental health, they mentioned about, I'm not as stressed and my smiling is more appropriate. And related to employment readiness, they mentioned definitely helped me improve my ability to building and preparation for interviews, work well with others in job environment. And in networking aspect, they mentioned, I'm going to try to keep in contact with people I have worked with such as peers and teachers. And finally, the sense of belongings, I felt a little connected to the group members. The activities helped me feel connected to the group. Finally, I just want to wrap up my presentation by emphasizing the importance of a many lives, theory-based, empirically driven interventions that is absolutely necessary to build evidence-based practices across different countries. And the use of community-based participatory research approach to enhance the feasibility, applicability, and acceptability. So the user could really find that the asset program is useful and practical. And the results of a study informs future group-based soft skills intervention for young adults with ASD in other contexts. For example, here in Slovakia and other countries that we have done in the past in Ireland and Hong Kong. And finally, results support expanded use in other developmental disability groups that affect social functioning. So currently we have other studies going on that is validating asset for 
people with intellectual and other learning disabilities, as well as people with emotional and behavioral disorders. So I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share about ASSET. And here's my contact information. And this is the picture of this is the picture of the partic asset participants, facilitators, and some of the parents who came to our reunion. So it's really gratifying to see all the big smiles on their faces. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Connie. Now it's uh, time for a couple of questions uh, from our dear guests. So the first question is, have you implemented the asset program for other groups besides autism spectrum disorder people? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, please answer. Okay, Thank you. All right. So definitely. So we have implemented the asset program in um, first with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Second, we also have implemented in um, the juvenile individuals with incarcerated in individuals, which means that they have been involved with the juvenile justice system or the adult justice system. We also have implemented with people with emotional and behavioral disorders. So uh, currently we have collaborated with different organizations. We are uh, we are expanding it into other type of disabilities. So the answer is yes, we have implemented it with different disabilities and also in different um, contexts. Okay, the second uh, question is from me. It's very simple, but I, uh, but I fear the answer is not so simple. Uh, what should be the first thing for us in Slovakia to do when we would like to start uh, em employing people with disabilities? So that's a great question. I always start by saying attitude is the most important. So the attitude of the individuals with disabilities or with autism, their motivation, the attitude towards working. So if they are motivated and have a positive attitude in working, they will be more eager to learn the different knowledge and skills. The attitude of employers. So they, if the employers are having more open arms to give the opportunity and hire people with disabilities, not just hire them, but support them that will be very important. Third, the attitude of their family members or even service provider to have higher expectation of people with disabilities because if they have high expectation, the outcome will be better. If they don't think, they don't believe those individuals will be able to work, they will not work. So the attitude always comes first from the different stakeholders. Ďakujeme veľmi pekne. Uh, Connie, that would be all from you. Thank you very much for sharing your information. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Ešte by som uh, vážení diváci na podium. Ladies and Gentlemen, I would now like to invite uh, Anka Podlesna back to the stage because we have a few questions for her as well. So let's start. Uh, the first question we have from Slido with the most number of votes uh, is uh, so in terms of uh, companies with this uh, project, uh, we need an internal mindset shift. Uh, what are the recommendations how to promote this topic? Yes, that's why we are doing the Professia Lab project. We cannot change it overnight. I can uh, tell you how it worked uh, for us uh, when we decided we wanted to recommend something, you know, we needed to test uh, it uh, uh, on ourselves first. Uh, so we had questions, you know, how to provide feedback, how to communicate with that person if something is not correct, uh, what if something happens to that person in terms of their health. So that's why 
these meetings of Professia Lab uh, should take place at least once a month and gradually go over through different areas. So when in May we uh, open the system of registration, you know, so that uh, these uh, people are more self-confident. Uh, of course, these fears are natural. If we do not have uh, our personal experience, we don't know how it goes. So this is the Slovak training manual for asset. Uh, one of the uh, translators had Asperger uh, and uh, when I wanted to communicate uh, with him, you know, uh, for a few times, a few emails, I didn't get uh, an email back and I, uh, you know, then I had to ask someone else whether he was coming back. Uh, so he read the information, he read my email, but he didn't know he was supposed to write back. So that was the communication skills or the absence of them, you know, so he was ready there. I mean. Of course, I didn't know that he didn't know. So each uh, person is different, but uh, we can deal with different particular situations with uh, different job seekers. Uh, so uh, we came across uh, different uh, situations, you know, maybe sometimes uh, no answers or uh, people didn't show up, etc. But after that, uh, uh, the uh, it, the, it, it was it was it was slowly uh, changing so we have to change the mindset not only and prepare not only the employers but also the job seekers so we will have to deal with situations that will arise you know with a particular person but we are doing it uh, so that we can get better and so that we can you know find the common ground thank you Next one, which uh, group of uh, people with uh, disabilities would be easiest to employ in Slovakia? So uh, that uh, ha is most motivated and best equipped to work at a certain uh, workplace, you know, because there are different requirements uh, in a, a hotel, in an IT company, in a shopping center, etc. And that's why we want to offer this diversity depending on the needs of the companies. We want to prepare the job seekers. That means a group uh, that has uh, uh, done a certain training, uh, perhaps, uh, but which uh, group to start with, you know, when you were saying that this approach process had to be set in some kind of way. So who to choose? I think I would always have a look at the capabilities and skills of that person, whether he or she is fit for that uh, purpose. I mean, for that work, you know, whether there is a hearing, visual impairment, or maybe some kind of mental disability. So whether that person is keen to work and has the skills and motivation and the capabilities. You have touched upon the the importance of soft skills, and not only you, but also Connie talked about the importance of these skills. Uh, so you know, uh, it's not just about hard skills. Uh, but uh, Connie said that ninety percent of people who lose their job is uh, uh, as a consequence of the absence of uh, soft skills. You know, which are the most important ones? Uh, we had a table where uh, the job advertisements for the last uh, three years, uh, 2019, 2020, 2021, were uh, reviewed. So English language and communication skills, uh, you know, these communication skills are particularly important uh, because we have a hybrid way of working. So not always uh, the work is carried out in the workplace. So it's very important to communicate, you know, in a remote way, maybe from home or a different place. And it's different than being uh, there. So communication, that's something that moves us forward. Uh, and also our data show that communication skills are very important. Thank you very much for the time being. So this was the like the first section of uh, questions and our answers. Now we will have a short break till 3.30 and then you can look forward to three more interesting presentations. So if you want to talk to Anka or maybe someone else, you know, you can do it during the break. Thank you.
Vážené dámy a páni, poprosím vás, aby ste... Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you to take your seats uh, because we are about to start the second session of our conference so where we are going to give the floor to James Caleb Adams, who is the Vice President uh, for Human Resources uh, at Peckham. Uh, this uh, company employs more than 3,500 uh, people with a variety of disabilities and we hope that Caleb uh, will show us uh, and share with us uh, some know-how uh, and that it will be inspiring for those uh, of you who are here or watching us online also to take part uh, in such programs. Uh, if anyone wants to listen to the Slovak interpretation, then we have uh, the devices, the headsets here, and you can take them at the back. So, Caleb. How are you doing? Thanks for doing great. Uh, so the, the stage is yours. You will do your presentation Excellent. and then we'll ask you a couple of questions. Wonderful. Enjoy. Um, well, thank you everyone uh, for, for coming today and for inviting me uh, to, to speak today. Um, I work for an organization called Peckham Incorporated uh, here in Michigan. So I'm here in Michigan and in the United States. Um, and I had the pleasure of spending quite a few months working with, with Anna Podlesna, uh, talking about how we as an organization employ individuals with disabilities. Um, Peckham is a nonprofit. However, uh, we are what we call a social enterprise, which kind of makes us a little different than a lot of other nonprofits that rely on donations. Um, we run lines of business uh, uh, mostly we do government contracting, um, uh, we uh, produce products uh, for the military, and um, uh, we answer phones uh, for the U.S. government, um, but we employ individuals with disabilities on those various contracts. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization, about the uh, types of businesses that we run, and then how we employ individuals with disabilities. Um, uh, like I said, my name is Caleb Adams. I'm our Chief Human Services Officer, which means I report to the CEO. I've been working in this field for about 18 years. I have a master's degree in clinical counseling. Uh, I'm a licensed counselor, and I also have a master's degree in business administration uh, from the executive uh, uh, MBA program at Michigan State University. So uh, Peckham, again, is a, a affirmative business. On an annual basis, we work with somewhere between five and 6,000 individuals uh, across, um, across the United States, Michigan, Arizona, and Kentucky. Um, we employ usually between 2,600 to uh, 3,000 individuals uh, on our lines of business. Um, our total, uh, uh, you know, if you include our staff, we have about 3,500 people that, that work at our organization. As you can see, you know, our gross revenue uh, is a, uh, usually over 200 million. Um, we bring back a lot of money and wages uh, to the people that we serve. Um, we place into employment about 700 people a year. That's outside of our organization at other employers in the United States. So it could be in the Lansing here, it, it could be at a pet store, or it could be at General Motors or Ford Motor Company or something like that. Um, However, about 79% of the clients or persons that we work with have a significant disability. So let's talk about what that means. What do I mean by a significant disability? Well, that could be individuals with severe and persistent mental illness, physical disabilities, uh, uh, cognitive uh, uh, disabilities, uh, autism, individuals who are deaf uh, or hard of hearing, individuals who are blind or visually impaired, uh, or folks with traumatic brain injuries. So a whole variety of different disabilities. And this is a conference on neurodiversity. So I'm definitely going to talk about that. But I just want you to know that that overall, we, we employ folks with a, a whole variety of, of disabilities. We're also a really great place to work. So we, we look at our organization as a people organization. And yes, we serve people with disabilities, but we are coworkers. We work together in building this organization. And so we, uh, these are some of the awards that we've won. 
Um, but we are we we really focus on making a quality work environment that focuses on what people can do versus what they can't. So how did Peckham get started? Before I go into our lines of business, I just want to go back in time to the 1970s here in America. Um, we were formed in 1976. This was long before um, uh, laws were passed in this country to protect people with disabilities. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, was passed in 1991. So back when we were formed as a nonprofit, uh, people were still very scared of employing people with disabilities. They were concerned about safety risks and they, they didn't want those types of people working at their organization. So we decided to start our own social enterprises to um, because we could see the potential in everyone that, that we were serving. We could see that they were very capable given the right accommodations with the right training and job coaching and uh, with the right supports. So from the 1970s until today, we've grown our social enterprises. Um, and, and really our first um, big social enterprise was the state of Michigan. So the territory that we're in um, decided that they were going to allow nonprofits like Peckham to bid on custodial work. And so here, this is the state capital uh, for uh, for the uh, state of Michigan. And we get to clean, uh, our first contracts were cleaning government buildings. And that taught us a lot about government contracting. It also taught us that, wow, our, our folks can not only do this, there's more that they can do. Um, but the federal government was still very concerned about working with nonprofits like Peckham. They didn't think that we could really perform. And that's what it comes down to. Our government customers expect the same level of quality, the same level of performance and the same on-time delivery as any other organization. So let's go to the next slide here. What happened? What changed our, our organization, Desert Storm? All of a sudden, the US military needed stuff, quick. <laughs> and so they said, okay, we'll try you. And we started producing long underwear for the US military. So a lot of the original long uh, uh, under, underwear that we used during Desert Storm were actually produced by our organization. And that really opened up the door with the US military because all of a sudden they saw what we were capable of, our quality, our on-time delivery, our ability to be flexible and meet their demands. And so now I'm gonna go through how we grew out of that in, 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 into the lines of business that, that we've uh, been able to create. So we are in general manu uh, in manufacturing, mostly apparel manufacturing. We have a line of business called business services where we answer phones for the US Department of State, the uh, US uh, Department of Defense, uh, the Department of Agriculture for the Forest Service. If you see those individuals uh, fighting fires out in California, you know, the smoke jumpers with their radios, uh, when they call IT support, if their radio doesn't work, uh, they're actually calling Peckham Incorporated. Which is, which is very cool. They're actually calling people with disabilities to help them with their IT issues. Supply chain, which is uh, third-party logistics uh, for the US uh, Army, Navy, and Coast Guard. Uh, we have a farming operation and environmental services is what we call our custodial crew. So let's go through each line of business. I just want you to understand the, the scope of, of what, what we're doing. Um, and let's start with supply chain. So in, for third-party logistics, the, the, the military is our primary customer. We have uh, about 176,000 square meters of warehousing space, and uh, we ship a lot of stuff. Um, we, uh, we receive about 16.1 million items, and we ship out about 10,000 SKUs a year from our, our um, uh, supply chain. Now, in... Um, uh, in that line of business, we have a lot of individuals who are deaf. We actually have a large deaf population of fork truck operators. And it's always surprising to me when employers here in the United States say, how could someone who's deaf operate a fork truck safely? And I say, well, about, you know, 10 or 20% of our workforce are deaf and they're on a fork truck and, and uh, we have figured out how to do it. And it's not that hard. You know, individuals who are deaf, uh, can drive a car, <laughs> and it's very snowy here in Michigan. Sometimes we get two feet of snow at a time, or, um, you know, I, I don't know what that is in meters. Sorry, I'm not on the metric system. Um, but uh, uh, so they can drive through a snowstorm to work every day, but you don't think they can drive a fork truck around a little warehouse? So um, 
uh, you know, again, we want to, the reason we're able to think that way is because we focus on what people can do versus what we think they can't do. Uh, warehouse logistics is a great environment for individuals uh, with neurodiversity, individuals with autism. It's very repetitive work. It's very detailed work. It needs to be done the same way every single time. And in our warehouse logistics, we have a 0.001% error rate. We have some of the best metrics in the U.S. military um, uh, uh, logistics system, and we get awards all the time for that for our quality. Uh, and again, doing it with people with disabilities. Manufacturing, we produce uh, 36 different garments, a lot of cold weather gear uh, for the U.S. military. We also make a lot of body armor. Pictured here uh, is a body armor we're making for the Navy. Again, um, th uh, these are individuals with, with disabilities working on this line of business. Uh, and the government doesn't give us a break on quality. The body armor has to stop bullets. It just does. That's what it does. And so um, when we think about placing people in, into these jobs, uh, we do uh, a, a lot of work around training and supporting people learning their job, um, as well as support uh, uh, throughout the workday. But we still have to do that and meet the same price and the same quality as everyone else. Contact centers. So if you are an American and you call the Department of State about your passport, you're actually calling us. Uh, we receive those calls for the Department of State. And we have a whole variety of individuals with disabilities uh, on that contract, including individuals who are blind. Uh, we have individuals who on one side of their headset are hearing a screen reader called JAWS read their computer screen. And in the other headset, they're talking to the caller. And don't ask me how it works. Don't ask me how they're able to do their job. I've sat with them many times listening to them take calls. And I, it's very confusing. But um, uh, we recently had an uh, individual um, called, uh, named Lori Penfold who got to speak at the UN about her employment experience uh, on the, working for the Department of State, working for Peckham Incorporated, but, but answering uh, passport center calls. Again, we've also found that this is a great job for individuals with autism because uh, for this type of call center, all the information, it has to be given very detailed, very precise, and in the right order. And we're giving people instructions about their passport. People have to follow rules, okay? People have to do the right thing at the right time. And so uh, we, from a customer service perspective, uh, we found that, that we actually have quite a few folks with autism that do really well in this type of call center work because it's not sales or anything like that. It's an inbound call center and we need to give them clear and accurate information about their passport. I talked about custodial, uh, but we clean about my, 9 million. I forgot to transition uh, to, to, to move this to metrics. I'm sorry, it's 9 million square feet. You're gonna have to do the math. You will have to Google that yourself. Um, but uh, we clean a lot of office space throughout the day. And during the pandemic, uh, the governor for the state of Michigan uh, called out our custodians in particular for the, the excellent work that they did uh, cleaning the command center uh, for the COVID-19 response for the state of Michigan, as well as all the other work that we do. Um, and uh, yeah, it, uh, again, really great jobs for a lot of individuals with disabilities. Uh, farming, uh, we supply fruits and vegetables to our largest uh, uh, grocer retailer um, because uh, uh, we found that working with your hands, working outdoors works really well for some individuals with disabilities depending on, depending on their disability. So briefly, I'm gonna talk about this because I have about 30 seconds left, I think, um, but uh, all of this is possible for the job through the Javis Wagner O'Day Act. It was a law that was passed in the United States that allows nonprofits like us that serve people with disabilities to go after government contracts. We have to have at least 75% individuals with disabilities on our uh, on, on those contracts, and we have to meet the same quality as everybody else. So how do we do this? I love what Connie Sung said, Dr. Sung. She said it's a mindset. I've been working in this field for 18 years. I I still haven't learned everything there is to know about serving people with disabilities. That will take a lifetime to learn how to work with all the different types of disabilities and all the different ways that that presents and all the different jobs that are out there and matching people. It's very it's very complicated, but it's also a lot of fun and it 
the reason why we're able to do this is from the very beginning, we focused on what people can do. We focus on their strengths and we see people as people and they are our coworkers and we've developed a relationship with them. This is a picture of me in Bratislava a few years ago. I wanted to put that up there because I love the country of Slovakia. Um, if I have a silly look on my face, it's because that, that glass of beer is very, very empty. And then that was not my first one. So um, uh, that that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I know that was just a very quick overview, but I wanna thank you all for inviting uh, me to speak today. Thank you very much, Caleb. And now a couple of questions for you. Um, would you say companies that have experiences with people with disabilities give mostly positive feedback after employing them? Uh, I would I would absolutely say that, um, and that's be and that's because um, when they're working with a uh, nonprofit like like us, we do a lot of work matching the person to the job and putting uh, setting someone up for success and taking a strength based approach. And individuals with disabilities are just like anybody else. In fact, everyone here in the audience, um, at some point in your life, you'll be a person with a disability. I talked about uh, uh, Lori Penfold, who um, was blind and working at our call center. Lori became blind because she took a medication one day and the side effect made her blind. So she went to sleep one day being able to see, woke up the next day blind. And so I think a as an employer, it's very important to always understand that we're, we need to create a world where we can accept everyone and bring everybody in. When we're working with employers for the first time that are working with folks with disabilities, um, I think the the initial, there's a lot of fear up front, but once they realize that this person is a person like everybody else and they fit into the team, and yes, they have to do things a little differently, but it's okay. Well, it, it actually brings a lot of joy. Okay, thanks very much. The next question is, uh, uh, what kind of experience do you have with employing people with uh, hearment, with hearing impairment? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, so I talked uh, a little bit about um, uh, individuals who are deaf, uh, but individuals with uh, who are hard of hearing. I think it's the question. Um, so you know, there are a lot of accommodations uh, for for headsets and for hearing hearing devices. We actually employ a lot of folks who are hard of hearing at our call centers, um, but we really work with uh, the state of Michigan as well as um, uh, some uh, uh, other other nonprofits that come in and, and really fit people's headsets uh, so that they can so they can hear properly. Um, in our uh, uh, in our other lines of business, when we have things like stand-up meetings and things like that, we coach our supervisors to either have notes prepared ahead of time or uh, provide, you know, a written communication. We can also do um, uh, live um, uh, translation uh, on, on a device. There's lots of different devices that you can use to have live translation or live captioning for folks. So uh, there's so much, we live in a world of technology now. There's so many resources out there. Um, really, you just have to look at the specific situation and what needs to be communicated and then look out there what, you know, what options there are um, and really just talk with the individual in an interactive process. Okay, you were also talking a lot about uh, uh, your successes that you have, for example, in logistics for the U.S. Army or in other tasks that you do. Can it also be an advantage to employ people like that? If you work that, if you do that extra step and make this uh, make this flaw uh, a positive thing, uh, absolutely. You know what our government customers want is stability. They want predictability, and we have very good retention for the individuals that we serve. Uh, in our call centers, we have. Uh, compared to other call center industries, we have very, very low retention, which means for uh, uh, passport customers, um, they get very good customer service. And the government uh, really wants good customer service because uh, that part of the government is actually funded by passport fees. Um, and so 
uh, our customers, that's part of our value proposition to our customers is, is stability, is having employees that have worked for us for a long time that know their job well. And our, um, our growth as an organization is absolutely tied to the skills and capabilities of the people that we serve. F uh, almost 50% of our staff, our supervisors, our coordinators, our directors, 50% of our staff are former team members or people who are receiving services who have been promoted into, into staff roles. So almost, almost half of our staff um, have, have, were originally people that came in as clients. Okay, uh, last question uh, from someone here. Um, how do you handle if you have to fire somebody with disabilities, but they are not performing at work at all? That could be one of the fears mm -hmm. of the em employers here as well. Like, okay, this person didn't perform, we have to fire him, but we cannot due to legislative reasons. So how do you do it at oh. Peckham? Um, we, you know, we employ a lot of folks, so we, we also let a lot of folks go. Um, we, we do have to terminate employment. Um, if, if there's behavioral issues or performance issues or things like that, they have to be addressed. And so what we, what we always focus on is the individual and where they are in, in their development. If there are some things um, that they need to work on, then as part of the termination process, we're getting them connected with other nonprofits or other government agencies that can help them overcome the barriers um, uh, that, that, that we saw while they were employed with us. We have many folks that, that come back to us like three or four or five times before they stick. We've fired them five times and we always have an open door. As long as let's say it's a, uh, a mental health issue and they need to go get on medication. As long as they go and work with a provider and get on, on medication to manage their mental illness, we will bring them back um, uh, into employment. And, and sometimes it takes a few times before people are successful. But some of our best employees are folks that have tried and failed me, uh, several times. But again, it's a mindset. How do we work with this person to help them grow as an individual? Thank you very much, Caleb, for all your insights. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much, and you guys have a, a lovely rest of your conference. Našim ďalším speakerom bude pani Daniel. Our next speaker will be Mrs. Daniel Bidik, who is the project manager for diversity and talent acquisition in Dell Technologies. Daniel. Hello. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm very happy to be here. I wish that I could be there in person. Well, maybe, maybe next time. The floor yeah, is yours. Exactly. Thank so, you. Definitely. Um, so hi, everyone. Again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's morning for me, but I know it's probably been a long day for you all. So I really appreciate uh, that you're here with me. My name is Danielle Biddick. I work for Dell Technologies. It's one of the largest technology companies in the world. We have over 165,000 employees. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Dell computers. And so today, what I'm here to talk to you about is our neurodiversity at Dell program. And just to give you some more perspective of what, what I do, what my daytime job looks like is I work in North America for our diversity uh, talent acquisition team. So my team is focused specifically on diversity hiring efforts, and I oversee all hiring across North America for individuals with disabilities. And within that encompasses our neurodiversity at Dell hiring program. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. So the program launched in 2018 in partnership with a local nonprofit organization called Neurodiversity in the Workplace. Uh, and the idea that was presented to our talent acquisition team actually came from our employee resource group, True Ability. We have different uh, large groups of employees that are with shared ideas, and uh, they were the ones that brought the, um, the idea of starting a neurodiversity program to our talent acquisition team. And we had some really wonderful executive support from, from people that were in our C-suite, so we call it. So people that have line of sight to Michael Dell supported us with getting the program started. And we started very small. 
And we created the program with the intent to provide career readiness training and a different type of interview experience, along with some on-the-job supports for neurodivergent team members and job seekers. So we offer both internships and full-time opportunities across a variety of role types at Dell. We are a technology company though, so a lot of the roles that we do hire people for are pretty technical roles, but we see everything from data analytics, software engineering, marketing, sales sometimes, um, but the program mainly sits in the United States, and we also just recently expanded the program to Canada. My hope is that one day we can go more global, but right now those are the only countries that the program uh, operates in. So some of the reasons, kind of moving over to the business case here, some of the reasons why we launched the program uh, rely on the high prevalence of neurodivergence, specifically around, you know, the estimate of that one in 15 people are neurodivergent, which means that we're already working on teams of people who are neurodivergent here at Dell. If we work on a team of 15 or more people, then we already have team members who are neurodivergent. But what we were really interested in were the high unemployment or underemployment rates of this community. For example, 85% of autistic adults are either unemployed or underemployed. And we recognize that that's a very disheartening statistic because a lot of the skill sets that neurodivergent job seekers have are exactly what we were looking for at Dell. And so we attribute some of those high unemployment or underemployment rates to the traditional interview experience being very limiting for some individuals. Sometimes traditional interviews don't always allow us to fully showcase our true skills and potential. And we're, we were seeing that a lot of the time in traditional interviews, we rely on social nuances that sometimes aren't even related to the job. So we've hired people through Dell's program that have master's degrees in computer science, but we were hearing from them that they weren't making it past interviews and that's why they weren't getting jobs. So they were stuck in jobs where they were being underutilized, like they were working at a grocery store, yet they have this very high degree. But on the other side, we've also hired people through the program who do not have college degrees. They were self-taught because sometimes college just wasn't the best fit for their learning style. So we really tried to think differently about the way that we were screening resumes and we would instead want to get to know someone in a different way instead of realizing only on what we traditionally look for in a resume or even some of the questions or the format of that interview experience because we know that neurodivergent people are incredibly smart, incredibly great skill sets that we needed here at Dell great attention to detail, really a great at hyper-focusing. And so what we wanted to do was find out another way to be able to assess some of those skills, since we weren't always seeing them through the traditional back and forth question and answer style of interviews that you see very commonly. And so that brings me over to the hiring process. We partnered with Neurodiversity in the Workplace, that local uh, nonprofit organization that I told you about a minute ago. And we worked with them to identify a different way of assessing this talent. So we offer an alternative interview that is, it utilizes a skill-based hiring method. That, so skill-based hiring is designed to really cut some of that bias that we sometimes see in interviews because it focuses solely on the candidate's core competencies for the role that they're applying to. So through that hiring experience, we work with candidates for about over a week or so, and we meet with them on a daily basis uh, just to check in on how things are going because we offer them the opportunity to work on a project. We deliver the project to them, for example, on a Monday, and then we have them present that project to managers on a Friday. It's a pretty small project. It's not a project that we do at Dell, but it gives them the opportunity to show us what skills they have that would align to the role that they're applying for. For example, if we're hiring a software engineer, we will give them a small project. It doesn't take more than two to three hours for them to work on, but we give them this project so that they can demonstrate the skills that we're looking for them to do in the job. So if we're hiring a software engineer, we might ask them to show us how they can code in Java. 
I'm not very technical, so it can be hard for me to speak to some of the details of the work that they do. But we work um, closely with managers to understand what does this person need to do on your team? And then we have them show those skills through project work. And that gives managers a firsthand look at how someone approaches problems, the way that they work through any challenges along the way as they're working on this project. And then, of course, we see what their end product is. And so then managers have a firsthand look at someone's skills, how they would show up on the team. And it eliminates that need for candidates to, quote unquote, sell themselves in the way that we traditionally see through interviews. Another thing that we offer through this altered interview experience is we, we give candidates a template for them to put together a professional portfolio. This is something that they can take with them for any future interview experience, but the reason that we do this is because we have them show managers this portfolio, and our hope is that it gives managers all of the information that they would get from an interview, but it doesn't require someone to answer questions that they don't know they're going to be asked. So the portfolio talks about their personal skills and interests, their professional and technical skills, and then also shows a past project or past work experience that they've had. So instead of a manager asking those behaviors behavioral questions or where someone sees themselves in five years. We're really focused on what has this person done? What can they do for my team instead of does this person quote unquote fit? So that's a little bit about that, that alternative hiring process that we offer. So once candidates are brought in the door, they're hired on at Dell, we also offer an ecosystem of supports to them when they're here. One of those supports is manager training. And we provide that manager training before the interview experience. It's mandatory for managers to take. It's about an hour long training and it just goes over neurodiversity awareness. It breaks down what neurodivergence is by outlining some characteristics. Um, and then with that, we demystify a lot of stereotypes or stigmas along the way about what neurodivergence is. And our hope is that it will give managers a better understanding that everyone is different. There is no one type of characteristic or thing about neurodiversity. We really want managers to understand that they should take a very person-centered approach in getting to know someone. My favorite acronym is ATP, ask the person what, they, what works for them, how they can be successful. But through that training, we give managers a variety of tips and tools around how they can better understand how to support their neurodivergent team members. And I want to be very clear, the types of tips that we offer to managers around how to support neurodivergent team members, this works for all team members. This isn't just neurodivergent employees. And what I hear from managers a lot of the time after they go through this training is that they feel like I'm describing characteristics of a number of their other team members. And oftentimes managers will say, I think I might be neurodivergent myself. And they also provide feedback around how after going through this program and after taking the training, they feel like they become better people leaders because they're thinking a lot more intentionally about how they're communicating and how they're interacting and the way that they're thinking about their entire team, not just the person that they hired on through this program. So our hope is that some of these these, this information and this training and this awareness that we're giving to managers is preparing them to support all team members, not just neurodivergent team members. Another um, piece of that support structure is a job coach. I'm sure we've talked about job coaches in some of the other presentations today. Um, and so we also partner with local organizations, nonprofit organizations for this job coaching support. And the role of a job coach is very dynamic. It, it works differently for everyone. I actually used to be a job coach when I supported the Microsoft uh, neurodiversity program. So I've kind of seen both sides of the table now. I've seen what it's like to work with individuals one-on-one -on -one and to work with their managers, but now I've also seen the business side of things. So I have an interesting perspective on this, this job coaching support because it's tailored to the individual's needs. We often support team members with things like managing stress, developing strategies for time management or task prioritization, sometimes just navigating some of those 
rules of the workplace that no one ever spells out for us, uh, especially when we're all working remotely these days. It can be hard to understand what time do I sign on? What time do I take a lunch? Some of those questions that managers don't always answer when they hire someone on, the job coach can support with answering. The job coach also helps get to know the individual and understands any potential accommodations or changes in processes that might be helpful for someone. And sometimes the word accommodation can be almost scary for employers because I think they, they have this misunderstanding that accommodations are going to be costly or something that needs to be taken up through HR. That's not always the case. Sometimes accommodations are just changes in the ways that we work. For example, something that I hear a lot from employees is if we're having a team meeting, it's really helpful for my manager to give me uh, a heads up before the meeting that they're going to call on me to give an update about a project that I'm working on. Because sometimes if you're in a meeting and someone calls on you and asks for information, it can be very overwhelming. And then the individual doesn't always feel prepared to give that update. So something as small as just sending an email before the meeting and saying, hey, Danielle, I'm going to call on you today to give a two minute update. Here's what I would like you to share with the team. That can go a long way with creating a more inclusive environment. So I would urge you to think differently about what an accommodation means, because sometimes it's just a change in process or something to enable someone to be more successful. So that's kind of how a, a career coach works with someone. They usually meet with an individual on a regular basis as they're onboarding. So maybe for the first three to six months, they're meeting with them regularly. But then usually after team members are feeling confident and comfortable in their roles, they meet with the career coach less and less. But that coach also checks in with managers from time to time to understand how things are going and seeing if there's anything that they might be able to help them with. And something that's really valuable about that job coach checking in with managers is that they also can kind of offer that on the go training to the manager. If they are getting feedback from the manager and they think to themselves, maybe you should try this a little bit differently when you're working with this employee. It just serves as an extra level of support for the individuals. In addition, we also offer ERG mentors. So I talked earlier about our employee resource group. We have an employee resource group that's specifically focused on individuals with disabilities, whether they're you know, disabled individuals themselves, friends, allies, or caregivers. It's a group of employees that come together to offer training and support resources. And so I identify mentors through this ERG employee resource group. And those mentors are there to support someone as they're getting acclimated to life at Dell. They can answer some of those company culture questions. Since the career coach is external to the company, it's nice to have someone internally at Dell that you can go to to ask questions that maybe you don't want to always ask your manager or your team members. And so they're really there just as a friend, as an ally to help someone get, get used to life at Dell. In addition, we also offer a variety of professional development and networking events to the team members that we hire on. And the topics for those types of professional development workshops or events are always proposed by the team members. For example, we're coming up on end of year review time. So the time when you have that conversation with your manager about how you did, what your goals are, if you met those goals. And those can be very anxiety provoking conversations sometimes. So we offer training for team members around how to have those conversations, how to sometimes respond to challenging feedback and any other uh, professional development topic that we give to the team members are always requested by team members. Another example is we did something on uh, finances, just managing your finances, because sometimes, especially for the interns that we bring on, this is their first full-time job, so they need some support with figuring out how to budget and how to set up their benefits, things like that. Uh, lastly, we also have a neurodiversity advisory committee. So it's a group of employees that have been hired through the program or other allies who were not hired through the program, um, but identify as neurodivergent themselves. And they come together on a monthly basis to offer a variety of different 
networking opportunities, whether it be one-on-one -on -one coffee chats or larger group discussions. They have gaming groups or book clubs that they've developed through this. And so it's just a good community for people to come together and sometimes just answer questions or make friends. So that gives you a pretty high level overview of how the program works as far as the hiring process and the support offerings goes. But some of the takeaways, the key messages that I want to leave you all here with are that one, eliminating bias through skill-based hiring is a really valuable way to assess talent, especially for neurodivergent candidates, because it gives them the opportunity to showcase their skills rather than only relying on someone's ability to sell themselves or talk about it. Skill-based hiring is something that we're now seeing other teams do for all of their team members, not just neurodivergent candidates. So I really want to impress upon you that this isn't just something that works for neurodiversity programs. This is something that works for all team members and all individuals. And it's a really valuable way of hiring because it shows you exactly what someone can do. Secondly, uh, neurodivergent individuals are interested in and very skilled at a variety of different types of roles across all different industries. I'm giving you examples of what we've done at Dell, what works at Dell, but we're a technology company. So of course, a lot of the roles that we're filling are technical roles. However, neurodivergent individuals are interested in, in so many different types of roles and any company can do this type of hiring style and support structure. This is just not a one size fits all approach. This is something that all companies can do. I'm only giving you one example of how Dell is doing it. So I would encourage you not to think of this as only something that technology companies do, but rather that neurodivergent individuals are good at all different types of jobs across industries. It's also important to clearly highlight your company's accommodation request process at as early as the interview experience. Always try to understand what types of accommodations would help make someone successful in the workplace. For example, our altered interview experience and our job coaches, those are considered accommodations. So really think differently about what you're offering and if there's more that you can be offering to the employees that you brought into your company so that they can be successful or more successful rather. Um, Secondly, uh, including information on neurodiversity and traditional diversity training awarenesses are, are really important. A lot of companies offer diversity training and we don't always see that a topic of neurodivergence is brought up through that. It's really important to maybe think differently about how we can educate more team members on what neurodivergence is and how you can be a more supportive team member to neurodivergent people. And then lastly, valuing all employees' unique perspectives and ways of learning and thinking and socializing are really important because thinking of different perspectives and including them and celebrating neurodivergence increases innovation in your company and it also cultivates more inclusion. inclusion excuse me. So before I wrap things up, um, I just want to share that this program, it started in 2018 and it's been incredibly successful, so successful that we have hired so many people and we have a 98% retention rate from all that we've hired on. So we are looking at very lower turnover rates. We're keeping the employees that we've had hired on. We're seeing that they're excelling and they're growing in their roles and we're getting really great feedback from them that they feel like they can be their true authentic selves at work. Another great statistic is that for the interns that we've hired on, 93% of them have converted to full-time roles following their internship experience. So after someone comes to Dell, they try things out, that we're finding that they want to stay with us and we're converting them into full-time employees. So if you have an internship program at your company, that might be a really good place to start when you think about bringing on uh, neurodivergent team members. We have a number of excellent success stories. I'm not sure that I have a time to share all of them, but I'm constantly getting feedback from managers about what incredible work our team members are doing, how fast paced they're learning and how they're bringing in innovative ideas and perspectives to the company that's really helping us win in the marketplace. It's driving innovation and that's what we're looking for. And so I would highly encourage you to think differently about how you're bringing people in the door and the ways that you're supporting them along the way. 
I'm really excited to see where this program continues to grow and how it continues to evolve. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to expand to new regions over the next few years. And my biggest hope is that one day this won't even exist as a program anymore. We, we don't necessarily need a big program to hire neurodivergent people. My hope is that someday this will just be embedded into the way that we naturally hire and the way that we hire or that we support team members. So I'll leave you all with that. I definitely want to save room for questions. But again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really, really excited about this opportunity. Daniel, I will try to connect what you were just saying, which was very, very important for us to our Slovak context. So I will switch now to the Slovak language and show how this, what you were saying, relates to what we are planning. And then moderator will ask you some questions. But this was very important presentation for us. So I will therefore switch to our local language. Perfect. Ms. Mamali, teraz. Okay, so we had a presentation of James Callop from Peckham and uh, now also the presentation of uh, Daniel. If you have a look uh, at the material, uh, this uh, Professia Lab uh, guide, this is exactly what Daniel was talking about when uh, three years ago I uh, started to do our pilots, uh, Ms. Kozova, who started uh, to work with our volunteers. Uh, she told me, you know, if Kate, if just they could show what they are capable of and then do the interview you know that's what we hope for so first we would like to help the job coaches from ngos from non-profit organizations etc you know to show them what those work positions are about uh, how they can understand the work teams at the same time, we would prepare the job seekers, you know, we would uh, try and improve their uh, communication skills, etc. And then start with the visits to the company. So it's also an opportunity for the companies to observe if that job seeker has a potential to work there. Uh, that's what Daniel was talking about, you know, that they had a project maybe for two or th three hours, you know, maybe a small project. Uh, in a technology company, a different project uh, in services, uh, in manufacturing, you know, that's also what James was talking about. So that's what we want to follow, you know, to let those people show us what they are capable of and then, you know, uh, let them work with a, a, a job coach who can help that person prepare for that workplace and see if that person is suitable for that workplace. So this program concerns neurodivergent job seekers, but we had examples from manufacturing and we will have uh, further examples, but this is the process that we want to follow, you know, so to turn it around. So let people go and visit the company, try and test if something, you know, works for them and then uh, let them go to the interview. To show this is the iceberg, like the top of the iceberg, what you are talking about. So thank you very much. Of course. Thank you. Again, I'm honored to be here. Okay, Daniel. So a couple of questions from our audience. Uh, how to convince hiring managers to consider candidates with disability in terms of analyzing and adjusting job profiles in their teams? So much resistance still. Yeah, I, I understand that there may be resistance. And, and so when it comes to encouraging managers, I think that you don't necessarily think of it as, as needing to encourage people and rather just show them the value, focus on the skills. Um, there's no need to encourage someone when you approach them to let them know what great talent they could be bringing into their organization. And I think that just starts with education and awareness. Right after my presentation, you'll be hearing from someone who I absolutely adore, Sarah Sanders Gardner. She will be sharing information on, you know, really educating employers or team members, whoever, on what neurodivergence is. And I think that's a great way to bridge that gap because sometimes people just, what they don't know, they do, it's hard to, Edu it's hard to have them hire people if they're not educated in what the space is and how they can think differently about bringing this community into their organization. And so it really, I, in my opinion, starts with awareness 
And I also think it's valuable that if you have executive leaders at your company who have some sort of personal connection to the community, whether they're neurodivergent themselves or they have children who identify as neurodivergent, leaning on them to really spread the word from the top down can be very valuable as well. Okay, thank you. Second question, how to start with alternative recruiting process provided internally? We are very inexperienced, untrained with these limited resources. What is the sequence of steps? Definitely, I would look to um, organizations, probably uh, in the US, they're nonprofit organizations who um, really specialize in this type of work. I would be happy to send you any recommendations, but they a lot of the time can help you with developing that alternative skill-based hiring model and to just educate some of your hiring managers on ways to assess talent differently. Some of the examples that I gave earlier, um, really eliminating that uh, need for someone to participate in an interview where you're going back and forth and answering questions, maybe even just allowing someone to have questions in advance or think differently even about the way that your job descriptions are written. Sometimes we have qualifications written in our job descriptions that aren't actually crucial qualifications for the job. And sometimes they steer neurodivergent candidates away from applying for those jobs. Things like strong communication skills. What does that really mean? You want to think differently about some of the things that are written as a core qualification. The example I gave earlier about how we've hired individuals who sometimes don't have college experience because it's just not the best format for them to learn in, but they're self-taught the, the core important skills that we need for some of these roles. So maybe also considering hiring individuals who might not have a college degree, but still have the skills to do the job. It goes beyond just the way of how we're interviewing. It's much bigger than that. So starting from the job description to the interview process, educating people on what types of accommodations can be offered through that interview process are all very important pieces of making sure that you're offering a more inclusive experience for individuals. Okay, here is a little comment. Um, just a reminder, all of this is only for Dell in US and Canada. None of what is talked about is available in other offices. And there is a follow-up question, maybe from the same person. Is there a plan to introduce similar program in Dell offices in the European Union? Yes, definitely. I'm in conversation with other team members across the globe around how we can implement similar processes or hiring strategies. Um, what's really important is identifying that we have the right support structures to you know, help the individuals that we're bringing on and to help hiring managers and team members better understand ways to facilitate that hiring experience. And so we are working on it, but we want to make sure that we have the right structures in place before we introduce a program. So really setting up the groundwork right now is where we're at. And I'm the only one that's doing this at Dell. So I'm just trying to identify other uh, team members across the globe who can also support me with growing the program more widely. All right. Thank you for your insights and we're glad to have you. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity again, and I hope you all have a wonderful uh, rest of the conference. Thank you, Daniel, for your answers, exhaustive. And our next guest is Sarah Sanders Gardner, per person with autism who is uh, a founder of uh, the Autistic at Work, Sarah. All right, we're glad to have them and you can start your presentation and then okay. I'll ask you a couple of questions. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really enjoyed hearing Danielle. Danielle and I used to work together and um, I'm here today to talk about neurodiversity cultural responsiveness, specifically improving attitudes and communication barriers at work and really throughout life. And as Danielle was talking, um, I was thinking how similarly we think about neurodivergence and interacting with neurodivergent people is really just learning to interact with all people as an individual rather than as 
a group. And so the first thing I wanted to share with you is where the term neurodiversity came from. And that term was uh, originated from an Australian sociologist, Judy Singer, who said that neurodiversity is a property of the human population on Earth. And it's that word came from the word biodiversity, which is all different plants and animals and insects and um, even microbes. And all of those things are necessary to have a healthy planet. And so Judy said that all types of brains are necessary to have a healthy human society. And so when we look at that in the workplace, all different ways of thinking are also important and completing tasks, depending on what type of job you're looking at, are important to have a healthy, sustainable, flourishing workplace. So like all people, and this is the thing, this is the attitude that everyone needs to eventually get to, is that neurodivergent people are really like all people. And the things that they need throughout their lives and in the workplace are they need autonomy. They need to feel like they have a choice in what they're doing. And so sometimes the interventions that we try with young autistic people don't give them a choice, but they all need to, all humans need to feel like they have a choice in what they're doing. They also need to feel competent. They need to feel like they um, are good at what they're doing and they need to feel that they are effective at what they're doing. And so when you're giving feedback, and this is true for all human beings, right? Not only neurodivergent people, but when you're giving feedback on at any kind of job, it needs to start with positive feedback. You're doing this well. You're doing um, a great job at washing the cars, or you're doing a great job at writing this code and talking about how they can use those strengths in other areas of the job. So helping them use their competence and their mastery and their effectiveness in other areas of their life as well. That's something that oftentimes neurodivergent people don't understand how competent we are and we need support in that. And then also relatedness is something that all people need, feeling connected to other people. And that's sometimes more difficult for us because we communicate differently sometimes. And sometimes people don't necessarily understand us. I'm gonna talk about that in a few minutes of how to bridge that gap. But these three things, autonomy, competence, and relatedness are things that all human beings need in order to feel motivated from the inside, intrinsic motivation, so that they can work towards completing their tasks at work, feel like they want to come to work every day and get things done. Or if they're in college, which is where I spend most of my time is running a college program, they can feel um, motivated to get their assignments done, go to class and all of those things. So these three things together are very important to pay attention to regardless of the situation where you are interacting with neurodivergent people or all people. So whether you are a parent or a college professor or a educator in lower level grades or a workplace manager, it's really important to make sure that all of your employees and particularly your neurodivergent employees are experiencing these three things throughout their day and their um, whole experience. So I do want to talk about how we interact sometimes with disabled people or neurodivergent people. Oftentimes we use a deficit model or a medical model. And I think Connie maybe spoke about this earlier where we, we try to fix the person and we try to make them um, act like everyone else. We see the person as the problem and we think that there's one correct or typical way of being. So examples of this are in school where we think everyone needs to sit up straight and um, you know maybe have their hands folded or look at the teacher, um, or we think everyone needs to socialize in the same way. 
And this model embraces cultural expectations that, that say people need to do things this way. But when you are interacting with people who think differently, especially neurodivergent people, a social justice model or a model that describes the situation is a better model to be thinking about. And this is part of changing those attitudes that can um, really go a long way towards embracing neurodivergent people into your workplace. And so this model seeks to empower the person to use their strengths, which I talked about in the previous slide. And it sees barriers to access as the problem. And as Danielle was talking about, those accommodations can be very simple. They can be sending things ahead of time. They can be um, allowing different things that are simple to implement. So looking for those barriers and understanding that there are many acceptable ways of being in the world and interacting with others and questioning those cultural constraints. So as our picture shows here, um, we don't want to turn all our apples the same color, right? We want to keep the different colors and flavors of apples or people, um, maybe even add some other fruit to our fruit basket, maybe even some vegetables. So I do want to spend a little time talking about why it is that um, neurodivergent people and non-disabled people have difficulty with communication. And that is because of, um, there's a kind of a cultural divide in the way that we communicate that is tied to nonverbal, not non-speaking, but nonverbal communication. Um, so nonverbal communication are, is things like, um, gestures that we make, it might be tone of voice, it might be how we look at someone, how we use our eye contact, all these different things are nonverbal communication. And it's also when we imply something rather than say it. So um, if Danielle uh, calls me and invites me for coffee, and I say, um, and I don't want to see Danielle, I might say, oh, I can't, I'm busy, when really what I mean is I don't want to see you. That's an implied conversation. So I'm going to use Edward Hall's cultural iceberg to talk about how, why this happens and what we can do about it. So Edward Hall was a cultural anthropologist who specialized in nonverbal communication. And he said, when we think about a culture, we think about this surface culture. We usually think about food and um, music and literature and language and all these other things that make up the surface of the culture, but aren't really the culture. And so what really makes up a culture are these deep culture areas that in order to really know and understand, you have to live in the culture and observe them through nonverbal observation. So that's how people learn a culture. So if you've ever had the experience of going to another country with a very different culture from yours, you've realized that you don't necessarily understand everything that's going on or what the expectations are. Or as um, Danielle said, you know, in a new company, the company culture is often not explicitly told to someone. They're expected to just kind of pick it up. So there are many different things that are not explicitly told to people in their culture or not even taught. Children just learn these things through observing their, their family members and other people in society. So things like communication styles and rules, um, the facial expressions we make, the tone of voice that we use, how we display emotion, how we talk to different people in different social situations, um, courtesy notions of courtesy and manners, um, how we think about friendship, how we think about cleanliness and modesty and beauty. Um, concepts of self and past and future and fairness, roles related to age and class and family, uh, attitudes towards all these different people in our lives, attitudes towards um, work and authority, 
uh, even relationships with animals and approaches to religion, marriage, raising children, problem solving, all of these things are culturally based. And so when we think about neurodivergent people who aren't picking up how we're supposed to behave from observing in the culture, we end up uh, creating our own cultures around these things, which are different from the culture we grew up in. And so there is a culture clash, if you will, between us and the rest of the population. And you've probably experienced some of these where you may have um, experienced a neurodivergent person as their tone of voice um, or the words that they say maybe sound rude or angry, or perhaps they're not talking to the boss uh, in a way that sounds respectful to you, um, and many, many other things. And so it becomes a place of awkwardness in a conversation or it might become a place where someone is getting in trouble in school or at work because people think they don't know how to behave or we don't know how to behave. And so there are many times throughout my life and the life of my students where they're getting uh, in trouble or they're having relationship problems because people don't understand what their intention is in the way they're behaving or the way they're communicating. So an example from my life, um, when I was, well, I'll give you a driving example. So in the United States, uh, as you likely know, there's many different states. And I grew up on the East Coast of the United States uh, where there's lots of snow, the land was very flat and everyone's very direct um, in their communication. And I learned how to drive there and it was pretty straightforward. There, was, there wasn't any special things that people did driving in Buffalo, New York. And then I moved to Los Angeles, California, which if you watched movies of Los Angeles, California, everyone drives very, very fast. They drive very close together on the roads. Um, they enter and exit highways without much warning. And um, it's just a little chaotic. And then I moved to Seattle, Washington, where everyone is very polite and they will drive very slowly and they leave a lot of space between the cars and um, they will literally just stop on the highway to let someone else in. In my opinion, it's dangerous because they're too polite the way they drive. So when I first moved to Seattle though, I couldn't understand why everyone kept pulling over and letting me pass them because I wasn't speeding. I learned pretty quickly that I couldn't speed in Seattle. You know, in um, in Los Angeles, we went almost twice the speed limit, but in Seattle, we had to go the speed limit. So everywhere I went, people were pulling over and letting me pass, and then they were staring at me like there was something wrong with me. So finally, a friend told me, you are tailgating, which means you're driving too close to the other cars. And I said, I'm not. There's at least a full car length in between me and the other cars. And what they told me was, in Seattle, you have to leave three car lengths between you. Well, where I drove for 20 years in um, Los Angeles, if you left three car lengths, people would just go in front of you and you would never get anywhere. You would literally just always be at the end of the line of cars. So that's an example of someone with a nonverbal learning disability, autism, other neurodivergence, not being able to observe how everyone else was doing something and not picking up what was going on. And so that type of misunderstanding goes everywhere at work, everywhere in friendships, everywhere at school. And so um, let me give you some takeaways because typically what people try to do is they try to put us in a social skills class and they try to teach us how to do these things so that we don't get in trouble or we don't do the wrong thing. But the problem is, as I've just illustrated, 
all of these cultural expectations are flexible within different groups in the same country or in the same area. So different friend groups have different expectations, different families have different expectations, different classrooms have different ones, different uh, workplaces have different expectations. I'm sure the company culture at Dell is very different from the company culture at Microsoft, and it just expands everywhere. And so if you try to teach a neurodivergent person the rules, they will be awkward the next place they go. And so it's um, really hard for us and we end up being very awkward and sometimes um, left out of things because people really don't understand why we're so weird and different. So let me tell you how to respond if someone comes across to you in any of these areas as rude or um, doesn't fit your cultural expectations of what you thought they should be doing or saying. So um, one of your action steps is to have a most respectful interpretation of what they said or how they said it or how they're behaving. So give them the benefit of the doubt. Just assume the best for why they're doing or saying what they're doing. If that doesn't take you far enough, if you still have questions, you can use a technique called manage your stories. So manage what you're thinking about what they're saying or doing by asking some questions of them and reword, maybe rewording what you're saying. So an example that I have of this is I was giving a talk one time to a group of faculty at our college and one woman Everything I said, she just just kept shaking her head. And I thought to myself the whole time, I thought, boy, she's smiling, but she seems to really be disagreeing with me. I need to find out what's going on. So after the uh, workshop, I went over to her and I said, you know, I'm so happy that you came to the workshop today. Uh, you seemed like you were enjoying it. I'm a little confused, though it seemed like you really disagreed with a lot of what I said. And she said, why do you say that? And I said, well, because you were just shaking your head to almost everything that I said. And she said, oh, I grew up in India and that is called a head bubble. And I was actually agreeing with everything that you say, but to someone in the United States, that looks like I'm saying no. And so if you, um, if any of you have gone to India or grew up in India, you know what I'm referring to, that head bobble, which means yes, but looks like no to people who use the no as a negative. So asking clarifying questions can often give you more information about what you need to know. And if someone is trying to be rude, asking a clarifying question can help you as well, saying, I'm not sure I understood what you meant by that. Could you please say that again another way to help me understand. Or you can reword what you said and say, you know, um, it sounds like you might be angry at what I said. Let me try to say that differently and see if that makes a difference. Or you can simply ask, um, as Danielle said, I think I'm going to take that um, ATP from Danielle, ask the person. So ask them, you know, are you angry right now with what I just said or with the situation? And lastly, you can own your own boundaries, which means if you're in a situation that you're not enjoying or is making you upset, you can move away or leave the situation without trying to change the other person. You can simply say, you know, I'm going to go get a drink of water. I'll be back in a little while. You don't need to tell them once you've calmed down, I'll come back. You can simply remove yourself or do whatever you need to take care of your own self without changing that, without trying to change the other person and how they're behaving. And let's see. So this is just a quick reminder. Um, like all people, neurodivergent people are handling a lot every day, right? Every person, and as Danielle said, neurodivergent people are no different from other people in the way that we have 
problems in our lives. We have exciting things in our lives. We have relationships. We have all sorts of things going on. Um, so in order for you to be able to relate to us, use your most respectful interpretation, be kind, and use these communication tools so that um, you can bridge that communication gap. Neurodivergent people are already trying really hard to communicate with you, and so your um, job is to also try to communicate with us rather than trying to make us change so that we are more like you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we have a question here about networking. I'm going to read it out uh, because Anna also wants to give a context to that question. Uh, why is networking put on such high pedestal? In my books, networking is just a fancy word for nepotism. Networking is a ableist in its very core. Anna? I want to add Sarah because you are, actually, they are very important uh, facts which, which can be explained right now. We had analysis of job requirements uh, during uh, last three years on stage uh, in the first presentation. And uh, I understand that networking can be understood differently. So networking in our analysis was meant how many contacts you have in order to find job. And the uh, asset program, which is focused on soft skills, and we want to implement it in Slovakia, is complementary to what Sarah was already saying, that we don't want to teach certain type of behavior we want to explain potential social situations happening in the workplace. And that's very important to understand how to read the situation in the workplace and to be able to answer or to respond to that situation. And ne uh, networking, uh, which was in this question, we have many questions on Slido and we are not selecting only positive questions, but networking is not meant that people with, who are neurodivergent will attend team buildings, will be excited about joining large group meetings. It's about being able to find partners, to communicate, to, to build the networks of people you know. It's not about large events, it's about being able to have contacts with people. And what Sarah was mentioning was very important that it's not about behaving, which is mainstream behavior, it's ability to read social situations in the workplace. But I will let Sarah now to answer the question, because this was question probably asked from someone who is neurodivergent, and I totally understand the question. So if you can repeat the question, and Sarah, maybe, if you can respond from your experience, how you read networking as a neurodivergent person. Yeah, if you could go on or you want me to read the question once again? Yeah, yeah go ahead and read the question once more if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, why is networking put on such high pedestal? In my books, networking is just a fancy word for nepotism. Networking is a bellist in its very core. Okay. Um, that is a great question. And so I would encourage you to... Think of networking in a way that works for you. And so, yes, if we think about networking in the typical way, as Anna was saying, um, going to large events, et cetera, then yes, that would be able us to expect someone to go do all the things that typical people do. And so what I teach at the college and what I would hope that people are doing um, outside is thinking about what strengths you have and what communication strengths you have, whether that be um, online communication strengths, written communication strengths. Um, it doesn't have to be all in-person going to events kinds of things. Um, and then also think about what it is you want to be doing as a career, what 
types of um, situations those people find themselves in and how you can get to know people in those groups outside of large events that don't work for you. And also how you can um, accommodate yourself if you need to go to a large event. Let's say there's only a large event for some particular thing. Can you wear, can you wear earplugs? Um, I always have my earplugs with me. Can you wear earplugs? Can you wear um, darker glasses? Can you request a quiet room to go to in case you need to escape the noise? So my encouragement to you is to change the word networking in your thinking so that it works for you. We can't avoid people altogether. We do need to get to know people in order to find work, um, but we can make it make networking work for us. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah, uh, for your input to this uh, conference. And I'll will be glad to hear some time out again from you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dámy a páni, mne dovolte. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite a very special guest, uh, Mrs. Uh, Zuzana Stavrovska, the commissioner, the make sorry, the commissioner for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I would like to ask you, are there enough uh, job opportunities for people with disabilities? What is your opinion? Thank you and hello. Maybe to start with, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, to the organizers on the great event, uh, great uh, motivational, inspiring speeches, uh, you know, uh, very uh, encouraging for us uh, how we can increase the engagement of people with disabilities on the open labor market. And this is uh, in part also my answer. Yes, it is very difficult to help uh, people with disabilities uh, to find employment and our office uh, also deals with uh, maybe complaints uh, where job seekers complain that uh, did not or the employees uh, did not have uh, the conditions adapted uh, at the workplace and there is the convention uh, through which the state has committed to creating suitable working conditions also for people with disabilities to be able to work on the free labor market and not to have to resort only to social enterprises or protected workshops and even the United Nations Committee has uh, has uh, you know uh, imposed this ob obligation or commitment on on the state, uh, so we think that uh, it's really about individual initiatives uh, of uh, of uh, people who want uh, to work, who are interested in having a job, and uh, uh, having a you know, source of income uh, to be independent. Uh, so, so if I go back to the uh, convention on uh, the protection of people with uh, disabilities. Uh, so the employment of people with disabilities is a great challenge for each employer. And I think it is, you know, it is a way or there's a way how to uh, increase uh, awareness and sensitivity of these companies and the society as a general to the needs of these people when it comes to employment. Is there one particular thing uh, you can take away from this conference? Uh, well, the great thing is the motivation and the enthusiasm and the creation of all these teams that are ready, you know, uh, teams of experts that are ready to prepare people with disabilities to find a job or to apply for a job. And what's important is also to retain this job, you know, so, uh, so that it's not only a short-term thing. Thank you very much and good luck in your work. Thank you. 
Now I would like to invite uh, Anna Podlesna again to come to the stage. Thank you, Shimon, for hosting the conference and thank you for accepting this role of the moderator. And we have a special thank you to the organizers of this conference. We have a colleague, Barbara Pernikova, and for coordinating the conference, I would like to ask you for a big round of applause. Without her, many things wouldn't have been able to happen. And Tomasz Masny, our intern, Milo Shishka, and other colleagues from marketing, and also the person who's very often invisible, Vicky Krutakova, our graphic designer. I hope one day she can hear this uh, because all the uh, graphic materials, you know, are thanks to her. We mentioned uh, volunteers. We are very happy to have them here, uh, but we have done a uh, work coaching as well. And uh, Ms. Andrea Kozova, uh, the leader or the director of the Social and Work Rehabilitation Center. Um, so we have the volunteers from uh, a school in Bratislava. We have uh, also people from the Help with uh, the Heart uh, program. So this way we want to give them more and more opportunities and training. So another round of applause for them. When Professia celebrated uh, 25 years uh, uh, on the labor market, I wasn't here, but uh, Professia has uh, a respect uh, to uh, difference and, uh, differences and diversity uh, to it um, among its core values. Uh, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity and to congratulate on the anniversary, the 25th anniversary to Dalibor, the founder, and uh, Ivana, the current director. And I know Ivana thanked me, but it's about the, all the values that we as company have, because 25 years, I think, call for flowers and a celebration. And Professia, is or are not the only ones who are celebrating their birthday, but Marek Sernak, this valuable young man, he entered our Help with the Heart program about uh, a month ago. His mom registered him. It's been a very long journey that we've done, but we had really nice presentations on success and sustainability, on how things can be done, how can they, they can be great, and it's a very arduous journey and we would like to you know uh, give you an example of a, a particular individual this young man who wants to get uh, more work experience and who wants to test where he would like to work obviously not eight hours per day but maybe some kind of a job two or three hours per day and it's his birthday today so Marek Serna happy birthday to you all the best to you. So Marek, uh, who's the face of our event, we've got the cake, the birthday cake for him. And we have a birthday present as well. So what Marek wanted, he has had an opportunity to work at Tesco's, but we have a new company, new business, a hotel. We really wanted to have a hotel, and now I would like to ask the Holiday Inn director from Trnava to come and join us, Mr. Vladimir Michko, and Marek will have an opportunity to have a work placement at the hotel. So it's a symbolic welcome to the hotel for Marek. So this is an example of why we are doing what we are doing. Thank you for being with us, the journey is not easy, but if we 
do it together if we learn from each other, also from people we have heard here. I'm sure in a year's time we will be able to hear our own experience of businesses and job seekers. Thank you very much and I will give the floor back to the host. And of course, one big thanks to Anna Podlesna, because as I said, without her, we wouldn't be here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here with us. Uh, you can download all the information from the or through the QR code uh, on our website. One technical piece of information at a uh, quarter past five, we will be signing the diversity charter. So I would like to ask the signatories uh, to come here to the foreground. Uh, and they will be picked up by the Pontis representatives. So we are finishing our live stream, but we are staying here in the conference room. Anna will be here as well. And I hope that we will have a constructive and productive network meeting. Thank you very much and hope to see you next year.